Well, hello there, beautiful. It's Kylie Patchett here. and Welcome to the world and finally fecking free podcast. I deeply believe that the years during and beyond perimenopause are a rite of passage. All of a sudden, we find ourselves on the precipice of a life transition where our brain literally rewires and runs out of fucks to give. We find ourselves shifting identity, no longer caring what other people think, and being invited to expand into new ways of being. Here, we share the real and raw stories from women who have been through deep midlife metamorphosis, taken a leap of faith or broken the ties that bind us in patterns of staying small, stuck, and like our needs just don't matter. This is the midlife medicine you didn't even know you needed. Stories full of joy, despair, freedom, courage, and deep self-honoring. I am so glad you found us. Welcome. Welcome to another edition of Wild and Finally Fucking Free, the podcast today. I am very excited to introduce you to Geraldine Crane. Hello, Geraldine. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, We were connected by a mutual friend of ours and we just had this chat about any friend of Kat Marshall is a friend (laughs) friend of mine. Um, (laughs) Kat will be on the the podcast in a couple of weeks' time. So um, welcome. I'm very excited to hear your story. Lots of parallels. So we'll get going. So before we get started in your big transformation, um, could you introduce yourself to our beautiful listeners? Thank you. So Mm -hmm. I'm Geraldine Crane and I am a serene spiritual empowerment guide. So I always think I really have to explain what that means. (laughs) I don't know, it sounds good. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds amazing, but what? Um, So I generally work with women. I do work with the odd man, but generally women around Mm -hmm. mother wounds and I help them to heal their mother wounds Mm -hmm. using the love of the universe. Mm -hmm. So again, what does that mean? So I work with women who've generally had a toxic or a difficult relationship with their mother and you end up with quite deep mother wounds. And that can come out as people pleasing, feeling that your worth is is deeply attached to how useful you are to other people. Um, You may have issues around anxiety of um, always feeling you're not quite good enough or you've put your foot in it all the time. Those kind of feelings where you don't really trust your own judgment. So I help women to overcome those issues by working with them using serene spiritual hypnotherapy and coaching and serene spiritual way of working is something that I've come up with and I think we'll go into more later but it's a way of using coaching and hypnotherapy to help you to really get in touch with your divine self your Mm. inner divinity Mm -hmm. so that part of yourself that I believe lives time after time after time and is connected to a divine wisdom that runs through everything Mm. and once you really connect with that the confidence that comes from that connection is really powerful but I also help you to connect with your spirit guides and the reason I do that is they love you unconditionally undiluted unadulterated pure love and that kind of love is what a lot of us haven't had as a child Mm -hmm. and it's Mm -hmm. life scars so when you start connecting with that kind of love the healing and the peace and the joy it brings is is really powerful so I really bring that in too and when I'm coaching I also just bring in lots of different spiritual principles to help you to understand your best self better to have more compassion for yourself and to really see the power you have to change everything for yourself Mm. and it's beautiful I love it Absolutely. I feel like this episode is going to become a personal session for Kylie. (laughs) (laughs) I'm listening going, "Mm -hmm, I could do, mm -hmm, yep. mm -hmm." (laughs) I actually, um, when I receive like the responses to the questions that I ask pre like podcast interview, I read them and then I just file them in, you know, date order. And I didn't have, I've been up doing a training as I was just explaining to you, and I didn't have any conscious awareness of what we're talking about. And then I opened (laughs) your answers this morning I was like yes of course (laughs) of course (laughs) so uh, so much to say about this so much to say about this okay so hmm. actually first of all as you were talking a thing that came into my mind about the, the spirit guides and the universal love I have been watching I just watched Limitless, which is a series with Chris Hemsworth. If you haven't Mm -hmm. already watched it, definitely watch it. It's amazing. It's about 
longevity and taking care of ourselves and our connection to everything. Um, the final episode is a tearjerker, though. Just be warned. <laughs> I uh, like Ella, a good tearjerker. Oh, far out. Make me cry. Come on, oh, it's great. It's amazing. Uh, Love it. He actually, I don't want to say too much, but he experiences life as an old person just about to meet the end of their days, and it's, like, amazing, ne- mm-hmm. like, next level amazing. But um, what I started watching last night was How to Change Your Mind, which is a series that is to do with the use of psychedelics to offer healing from trauma yeah so yeah. Michael Pollan who wrote the book and who also narrates the story when I did my holistic health coaching years ago he had written a book about the power of plants as food mm-hmm. so the nutrition of plants so now he's moved on his interest into these psychedelic things and one mm-hmm. of the things that really hit me last night was the description of people um who had had I think it was actually psilocybin like the mushroom mm-hmm. psychedelic about mm-hmm. how they saw finally their connectedness to mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. All the people, all the plants, all like everything, yeah. this lattice of just gorgeous, delicious energy in every single person. Actually, it's interesting because almost every single person describes dying in the first part of their experience and then coming mm-hmm. back and realizing that they are just mm. this gorgeous, you know stardust made into a body to have a human experience mm-hmm. oh, it's giving me goosebumps so that's what it's reminding <laughs> me of first off the universal love thing um let's rewind to where in your journey did you begin to be called to doing this work because th- this is you know this is what I'm obsessed by what's the story behind what you do okay um it's quite a long story there's kind of two halves to the story so mm-hmm. my spiritual development mm-hmm. well that started when I was well Actually, ironically, it was my mom who introduced me to spirituality Mm -hmm. and I am will be forever grateful to her for that. Um, So even as a little girl, I was listening to Louise Hay. I was doing like meditations and she introduced me to that side of things. And I'd read books about angels and Mm. loved reading about Gordon Smith, who's an amazing medium. If you ever um, read into him, he's amazing. Um, Scottish guy, very genuine, lovely soul. Mm. Um, But when I was about 19, I was having um, a lot of mental health issues myself, which I will explain more of the triggers. Mm -hmm. But at that point, met a spiritual teacher and she um, had been doing a bit of healing with me, but said, look, I'm doing a spiritual development circle. I'd really like you to be there. Mm -hmm. And I started going to that circle every week for years Mm -hmm. and through that really discovered that I had a particular ability everybody spiritually tends to have have different skills so my friend was a particularly powerful healer for me it was connecting with spirit guides I Mm -hmm. could feel see hear there's other people's spirit guides and get messages through quite clearly Mm -hmm. um And so that's when I started developing. I always say I'm not born medium. I had to work at it. I had to learn to develop it, which is one of the reasons I feel quite well equipped now to teach other people to do it. And I do. I have a serene spiritual development course to teach you how I connect with spirit. Mm -hmm. Not there's many different ways to do it. I just teach you my way. Um, It's a nice starting point. So that's is kind of where my spiritual journey started. And when I trained as a hypnotherapist, it kind of kicked it back into gear again, because you're putting yourself in a hypnotic state. Mm -hmm. You're putting yourself at a higher frequency. It's just, my guides just were like, woohoo, we're back. Like, (laughs) Um, which was beautiful. And then during lockdown, I really, really clicked into them again Mm. um, because I decided to let my business go quiet and really focus on my children. But to do, I knew to be, well for my children through that I needed to be well myself so I took two hours every day to meditate to read to journal Mm -hmm. and all this stuff and I was getting so much guidance and reassurance I started sharing it online and the response I got was phenomenal so that kind of kicked my spiritual stuff yes as far as working with women around the mother wound stuff that was very much um from my own personal journey. So when I was, I would say about 35, Mm -hmm. I was working, um, I'd worked as a probation officer. Mm -hmm. I worked with substance misuse for on and off 10 years. 
but I moved into working with domestic violence victims. And as I was working with these victims, one of the things that you do when you first meet them to help them to, because they come away from the violence or the particularly harmful um, environment they were in. And, but that's when all the emotional stuff comes up and mm. they're just like, I'm safe. Why do I feel so awful? So one of the things we would do is, is get them to understand all the different forms that the abuse could take. Yes. And so as I'm going through all this and explaining it to my clients, I would be going, oh, but my mum does that to me. She isolates me from people. She uses emotional manipulation. She um, controls me through guilt. She, you know, and it was so much of it was really familiar. Um, and I was very blessed at the time to be seeing a counsellor on and off mm -hmm. who was just superb and was very slowly, gently. She knew she pushed too hard. That deep programming I'd had from child to think my mum was the be all and end all would turn me back again yeah. so she was very good she very very gently started to meet to help me see what the problem was however when I was about 35 I was working in a charity working with these women loving the job and things basically went tits up I don't know if it's a particularly British <laughs> term saying. they went tits, tits, tits up it's <laughs> a very British term sorry um, <laughs> basically it fell apart things mm -hmm. went really messy um the the people in charge started making crazy decisions and everything fell apart and I lost what I thought was my dream job mm -hmm. so anxiety that had been troubling me since I was very young came back full whack um and I was quite poorly so I went back to my counselor and obviously as I started talking to her about stuff again my mom's stuff started coming up, up again because as I'd been really starting to understand and, and put trying to put boundaries in place she, her toxic behavior had got worse she got angrier more resentful nastier so my counselor just said to me and this was the pivotal moment that I will always remember and mm. always love my counselor for she said to me what would your life look like without your mother in it and that was the first point that anybody gave me permission to even consider it and my first response was, no, I can't do that. I love her. You know, mm -hmm. that was my initial response. Mm -hmm. However, she said, right, okay, but, you know, we need to put certain boundaries in place. There's things you need to do. And Christmas was just coming up and we know that pressure when we've got children and I, I've got my mother-in-law coming to stay who doesn't really get along well with my mom and, and <laughs> you know, it very was familiar. all a bit too much. Yeah, very <laughs> typical stuff, right? Familiar. And I... Um, <laughs> It was too much. I wasn't well enough to cope with it. Mm. And she was just like, you know, maybe you can ask your mum to go somewhere else. And there were other options. Mm. And um, so I did. And the response I got was so angry, so bitter, so resentful, so nasty. I mean, she screamed mm. at me down the phone. And it was just like, right, now I know I am never going to come first. Yeah. my my needs are always going to come below yours and probably below several other people's too mm -hmm. and it was just it, it immediately I just knew I cannot get well with her in my life I was going through my daughter at the time was being diagnosed with autism and learning disabilities and we were going around trying to get her support in place and I was not being the mum to her or my little boy at the time in the way that I knew I could be, I was losing my temper. I was emotionally a wreck. I would fly off at that, you know, and I, I knew that I need to heal because they need me. Mm. I have to heal yeah. and I cannot heal with this poison in my life. And at the time, that's what this relationship was. And not mm. saying that she is poison, but the relationship was yes. for me. Yeah. And, um, it's then that I just, I sent her, I did warm family members before I did it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I sent her a message just saying, I'm really sorry it's come to this. I didn't want to do this, but I have no choice left. You have to stay away from me and my children. Yeah. And and then I blocked her in from every way I could. Mm. Um and it was it was such a moment of pure relief, like, oh my god. I can breathe. So I knew I'd done the right thing, but also terror. What if she turns up on mm. my doorstep? What if she tries mm. to get my children from school? What if she does it? You know, and and then anger, like 
I started reconnecting with my dad, but he's 70 years old. I, I'm only just reconnecting with him and he's 70 years old. You told me he was this and he's not, he's that. And, you know, and reconnecting with other family members, she told me were poison and this, that, and the other. And mm. I'd felt so isolated from so many people for so long. And it was, there was so, there was a lot of grief. There was a lot mm. of anger. And then there's grief and anger over, she had some really lovely sides, some really fun sides to her. And it was just like, my children are never going to get to know that. And I'm never, you know, if she put her fear and her anger to one side, she could have been an amazing mom. She could have been an amazing grandma. So there's a lot of grief around that. So that it's a, it's a head fuck. It's, the nice <laughs> yeah. it's just, it really plays with your head. But it sent me on a huge healing journey. Mm. And along the way, I trained as a clinical hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me to let go of the fear and the terror. Mm. I then um, started meditating more, connecting with spirit, connecting with that. I got a coach who taught me about the three principles, which if you don't know, go look it up. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, and he got me to really understand that I was experiencing my thoughts and not my circumstances. And that changed a lot and brought so much peace. And then through that, I started reading Michael Singer, Eckhart Tolle, um, started listening to Abraham Hicks. I just, mm. I couldn't read enough. Mo Anita Mojani, I love that woman. Oh, yes, I just, me too. Yeah, she's just amazing. And it just sent me on this whole journey. Um, and this all happened coming up and through lockdown. So when lockdown finished, suddenly my clinical hypnotherapy business that I thought would just be focusing on anxiety, I'm like, no, no, I can do so much more. And I started meditating before my sessions, connecting with people's spirit guides, getting real guidance, and then realizing I can help them to meet their spirit guides. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, and then doing these deep chakra cleanses and finding the blocks for people and taking them on huge journeys and Eventually I've brought in past life regression as well. And it just has just exploded. And then more recently really started focusing on this mother wound, really coming out mm. and saying very loudly yes. that it's okay to not get on with your mom. It's okay to um, not even, you know, if you don't love her for certain reasons, there's no shame there that whatever that mistreatment was is not your fault. Yeah. However, and there is no shame, there is no shame. However, it is your responsibility to do something about it. Don't don't keep blaming her. Mm -hmm. We've got to pull our big girl pants on. Yeah, exactly. We've got to do the healing, you know. Um, but it's really whenever I speak about this stuff, there's always at least a, a couple of women will come up to me really quietly afterwards, just few tears in their eyes like thank you so much because I've never had anybody be so that honest about their mother mm. or it's just so good to know I'm not on my own or oh my god I have to deal with this and, and they just you can tell they just feel free to talk about it yeah. there's so much shame and stigma around this stuff you're supposed to love and honor your mother no matter what well fuck that I'm sorry yeah, exactly <laughs> no. this is what yeah uh, you know I understand that she's a human being. She has her own trauma. She's been through stuff, but she was also a grown woman who yes. could have protected her child and didn't. And, she, you know, while she can't take any responsibility for that, I can for me and my children and my life. And it's yeah. that, you know, and I really, it, it's a big passion of mine to get the conversation started, to free women up, to let go of the guilt. This and, is and, the, yeah, yeah. the word that's reverberating through me is free because actually yeah. there's a, a couple of things I want to pull out. When you had the realisation when you were dealing with the people with forms of abuse and you're talking about the, you know, guilt, mm. manipulation, et cetera, the, your reaction to freeing yourself is very similar to that reaction as well. It's like the mm. the, the relief, number one, thank God, but then mm -hmm. anger and grief over what could have been or should have been or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and totally honouring the fact that there is this ridiculous freaking expectation that um, that we should all, yeah, honour our mother, um, you know, feel deeply connected to her. I, I, <laughs> I mean, 
more power to the people out there that do have the relationship with their mum. But if I hear, yeah. oh, my God, she's my best friend and I talk to her every day one more time, I'm going to stick a fork in my eye <laughs> because I'm like, okay, that's one experience. And there's yeah. also lots of other experiences. And there's lots of other experiences where, as you say, you can absolutely not choose to continue to blame that person, but also to yeah. be the creator and the decider of, A, what boundaries I have in place around this relationship, what yeah. I'm available for and what I'm not available for. Yeah. And as you so eloquently put, if you're not doing the healing in this relationship, do you even have the space to be present for the people in your life? Because you've got all of this yeah. heavy, stuck, sticky, yeah. anger, resentment filled energy. And that is taking yeah. up space. <laughs> it has I to. Was des- <laughs> yeah. Well, I always describe it as you can't heal while swimming in poison. Mm. And if that person, like my definition really for me of toxic behavior is when somebody's doing something that harms you and no matter what you say or what boundaries, they refuse to acknowledge it yes. or take responsibility or take any responsibility for changing it. Like mm-hmm. if they will not acknowledge it or do anything to help, then that's toxic. Yeah. So because I'm actually writing a book about it, and one of the <gasps> things I'm trying to make really clear is toxic behavior from a parent doesn't have to be starving or beating or you know that or constant criticism doesn't have to be Mm -hmm. it can actually be way more subtle so a big part of um the toxic abuse for me was parentification Mm. so that's (laughs) when they put you in that parenting role so for me that looked like from being 12 I became my mom's full-time carer because she had physical health issues but she also had mental health issues so she would self-harm and it would be Mm. my responsibility to go and fix her so I would be the one taking the scissors off her trying to stop her from hitting herself around the head I would be the one feeding her and and helping her wash and yes there was some issues around maybe other grown-ups could have stepped in, but Mm. she made it so hard for them to do that because Mm. whatever they did was not done the right way. Mm. Whereas the way I did it was the right way. So she wanted me Mm. all the time. And there was no point did she, there seemed to be no consideration for maybe she needs a break. Maybe Mm. I need to accept somebody else not doing it perfectly Mm. so she can have a break. But and also your role as a daughter is not to fix, is not to fulfill the exactly, needs of a parent, exactly. is not to even be aware of the needs of a parent. Like when you think about, Well, that about, was it. She, you know, yeah. It was this, I was her confidant. I was her best friend. We was, I didn't even call her mom. I called her by her name, mm. which I now see is deeply unhealthy. Yes. And if my children call my, by my name, I'm like, ah, no, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm mum and I love being mum and yeah. I want to be mum. So yeah, there was there was this real blurring of lines. But of course, when that blurring of lines meant I would sometimes tell her off. My God, yes. it was all my fault. Yeah. It was always my fault. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, if I did things like I forgot to get her a drink of water when I got me one, I was a bad carer. Mm. Despite the fact I'd emptied her commode, I'd, you know, um, cleaned the house, all this stuff, I would be like, if you're always just one step from being the scapegoat when you're with it, what I would call, I would call this covert narcissist. Yeah, and you're always absolutely. just that one step from being yep. the scapegoat, the one, mm-hmm. you know, you go from being the goody two shoes to being the scapegoat very quickly. Mm. And it's that cycle of abuse where they put you on a pedestal and then they knock you off and then they put you on. But it, so I would have from being, 19 deep periods of depression and anxiety and she would rescue me from it you know she would always be the person I could talk to at five in the morning so I thought mm-hmm. she was amazing mm-hmm. not realizing she was the one that of course that was me creating to get there the, in the energy birth, that... that pressure yep. of carrying everything for her mm. you know from being so young when she shared with me her sexual traumas that she'd had she would share with me her financial worries she would make me negotiate with my dad through their divorce issues and finances you know that all that parentification that was responsibility I was carrying from being mm-hmm. so young and um and it was that that was causing me to break down she was just like you know other people should have helped you care it was everybody else's fault no it wasn't there were times there were things she could have done to protect me from it and mm-hmm. they weren't done and and when I started trying to have a life of my own and started trying to, you know, go out and have friends and do things, the guilt trips 
You know, if I had friends come over to the house and was giggling upstairs, she would be furious because I'd left her out. You know, there's just, um, this is what I mean when I'm trying to help people to see that you often with subtle, and from the outside probably don't look very subtle, but to me were very subtle kind of abuses that you don't come to realise how toxic it is until you're much older. Mm. For me, it was having children and going, what the... I would never do that to my children. I would never put that on my children. I will do everything I can to protect my children, Mm -hmm. you know, no matter what. And it was just, um, yeah, it's, it's helping other people to really see that they have a right to, to peace. They have a right to happiness. They have a right to, to just be without guilt, without shame. It's so, um, there's so many things that I want to say. This is what always happens in one of these interviews where there's, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> truth. Because I'm mm. I'm sitting here listening to you going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so my my reality was um, not to do with physical illness, but mental health um, issues mm. and parentification, dealing with um, multiple suicide attempts from mm-hmm. yeah age eight, and so. Um, but I really, really relate to what you're saying about the fact that when I always talk to people when I'm talking about mindset, like we grow up in a, you know, this snow globe and this is our reality and we don't know anything outside of it until we have a choice of putting ourselves in different environments and experiencing Mm -hmm. things and whatever. And so when you grow up in a snow globe where you are parentified and there is trauma bonding and you do get a lot of because there's a benefit to taking care of someone. You feel needed. You feel like, so you're trained, you're conditioned to give to someone else before yourself. And for me, that's You get so much reward for it, don't you? You get other people going, isn't she amazing? Look what she she does for her mother. Isn't she she so mature? And and you just, and so you're, you're, you really, your worth comes from, well, I am a good carer. I do do this. And then that's where you end up people pleasing. Oh, absolutely. And I think um, for me, looking back I was actually just talking to a friend of mine as well and she's like working with this therapist and all of a sudden I'm having all of these realizations like that was not okay Mm -hmm. it was my normal Mm -hmm. and I didn't know any different and even as an adult I haven't really questioned it until I'm experiencing my own mental health issues and my Mm -hmm. own stuckness and complete inability to create what I want in my life because I've got this old pattern going on and she's like it's like every session I'm like, that was not okay. That was not okay. That was not okay. But without that awareness, you know, there's mm-hmm. that there's that um, point. I think one of the key things that you just said is it's not my fault. This, this creation of these conditions is not my fault. Something absolutely, I was just talking to, I've, I've been diagnosed just recently with ADHD. So I was talking to my psychiatrist yesterday in my, my last review session. He's so cool. I love him. Love him, love him. He's a beautiful Indian man and he always delivers his, he just has these pearls of wisdom that he just drops in, you know, just drops in. And we were talking about um, when I first was diagnosed, I had to talk, you know, they ask about your childhood and rah, 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 um, because there is, yeah, many links between There's links trauma between ADHD and, ADHD and, trauma, and autism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but my is a good yes, one to read. Exactly. Mm. I feel like this episode needs to have a whole heap of um, books and connections on the bottom of it. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've just <laughs> written Gordon <laughs> Smith, <laughs> Abraham Hicks, Anita Mordani, <laughs> Eckhart Tolle. Uh, what was I doing then? Oh, yeah, Matt. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so one of the key things, and when you said you had that turning point where your therapist and, you know, God bless all flippin' therapists that give you the time and space to come to your realisations in the time mm-hmm. that you need rather than Should pushing too easy. hard, like like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, he, I mean, he was listening to some of the things I was saying about childhood and he said, oh, it actually sounds like your mum has a lot um, of the traits of female, a version of female autism where she's not able to see outside of herself. And I was just like, Mm. I literally had one, I call them chiropractic adjustments of the soul. I'm like, what the fuck? My Mm. entire life I have been going, it was my fault. I should have uh, tried harder. I should have done more. I should have been different. I should have whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're now saying or giving me an option to Mm open up this field of possibilities it's actually nothing to do with me and also further than that um 
that perhaps through whatever reason, she was actually unable to give me what I needed all along, which, you know, as you say, they're adults, get to choose. This um, is one of the main things I work on when mm. I first start working with people is um because I work from the idea of that we're living in in the experience of our thinking. Mm -hmm. So all anybody experiences of somebody else is their thoughts of them. So Mm -hmm. all my mother ever experienced of me was her thoughts of me. Yes. So really it's, it was never anything to do with me. It was all to do with the thinking that was going on in her head and whether that was caused by, um, being covert narcissist whether it was caused by childhood trauma whether she is on the spectrum somewhere um who knows and and it's one of the things that I really work with clients on because so many of them want to know why 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 and it's like you are never going to know just is. because people like that don't go to therapists Mm-mm. no people they don't like <laughs> no, they <laughs> don't. No, they don't. And so we're never going to find out. And it's making peace. It's like people talk about forgiveness, but I really focus more on acceptance. We have to accept that they do not have the capacity to be who we need them to be. Mm, exactly. We have yep. to accept that yes. because your suffering is coming from expecting more, not from their Correct. behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And so once I, it was such a relief for me to, realize my mom had limited capacity for whatever reason yes to protect me and to be who I needed her to be Mm -hmm. and actually what that brings up is deep compassion for me but compassion for her yep and that compassion brings me peace it's not about Mm -hmm. her it brings me peace and it frees me and that's that's the it's not letting her off the hook I don't need to let her off the hook. She's on her own hook. It's not yeah, to, to exactly. Do you know, whereas it's it's the peace that it brings me. Mm. I um, love yeah. that. Um, I had the <clears throat> had written down before the word forgiveness because I'm like I, I'm interested in your take because I, I found myself in a therapy session a couple of years ago going. I just want to get to the stage where I'm one of those really lovely like people and go just forgive everything and you know and she's like. <laughs> um. So still <laughs> you're trying to do something to make it all better rather than just accepting what is. And I was like, ah, shit, there I go. <laughs> she got you there. Yeah, exactly. So the acceptance piece has been really big for me and really understanding um, at the moment I have a lot to do, a lot more to do with my mum. She's moved, well, we've moved her closer. My stepdad is unwell and I've had mm-hmm. to be very, um, very careful in the boundaries that I set around what I am and am not available for. And I have to say me being clearer on my boundaries and really sticking to them, not just setting them and then breaking them, which is my, has been my pattern. Yeah. um, Has been quite transformative. I wouldn't say, you know, magically we have this amazing relationship, but she does more so respect. Yes. What, you know, what I can Which, and I can't do. And that is particularly the case when she's she's caring for my stepdad who has dementia. So it's, it's you know, yeah. there's, there's big stuff going on. Um, yeah. But the blessing in that is because one of the things, and coming back to what you originally said about the mother wound, I can't even find my notes, I've written too many, um, where you were saying, you know, the good girl, the people pleasing, the not enoughness feeling, um, is when you realise that perhaps this behaviour is, maybe not your fault, (laughs) open up that field of possibilities, then there's an invitation or I think there's an invitation as an adult woman to go, okay, so she was not able to give me X, Y, and Z. How do I give that to myself? Where where is this, you know, reparenting I think is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but how do I give back to myself and have the freedom? Because, you know, like we were saying before, this is a being caught in these codependent, toxic Mm. cycles of behavior which is contributed to by both people and you know I keep on saying oh yeah you've got to take some responsibility oh absolutely and because you get a lot like we're saying the benefit the secondary gain is there and but re-identifying yourself as someone that doesn't have to fulfill someone's needs and then actually acting like that and doing Mm -hmm. the healing and looking at yeah I think for me, I always am really aware that stress is the difference between what you expect and what reality is or what you want to happen, what reality is. And when you actually get mm-hmm. to that acceptance piece, it's like, okay, so there is no gap yeah, because I'm choosing 
to actually accept that this is what is. And then mm-hmm. that sets me free to be able to actually give myself what I need. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk about how the pattern with your mum has shown up in other relationships in your life where as you've been doing your healing journey, has there been relationships where you've just gone, actually, that's not something I'm available for anymore because it's a repeat of that pattern or is that played out in other ways? I've seen it play out in when I was younger, certainly relationships I got into mm-hmm. with men who wanted to be fixed. So yeah. they wanted they want, you know, they wanted me to be their crutch. Yeah. Um and they saw it was a good fixer, was, right? Uh, yeah, and I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this makes me good at my job, I suppose. So exactly. I am, you know, I'm grateful to her for that, to be honest, because mm-hmm. of all that she was my greatest teacher. Yeah. Me too. And I am grateful to her. I mean, it sounds corny, but I am genuinely grateful to her for that. Mm-hmm. And I do have a deep sadness for her that she can no longer have me or her children or my children in her life. Mm-hmm. And that is such a shame, but I'm not responsible for that. Nope. As far as it's showing up in other areas of my life, I'm just, I, I think she was kind of the final one. Mm. Like <clears throat> I'd done it in relationships. I'd done it in friendships. I'd had, you know, men certainly take advantage and, and you know, want me to fix them. I'd certainly had friends do it. But I, I'd i managed to cut most of that out by the time I then, my mum was the last hurdle. Mm. So it's like, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I'm very blessed that I don't know how I manage this, considering what a mess I was when I met my husband. Um, but I managed to marry a very beautiful soul mm-hmm. who would never do that, who, bless him, could see how harmful and toxic my relationship with my mom was. And he kept his mouth closed because mm. he knew I wasn't ready to hear mm. it I mean once I was ready my god you let rip <laughs> <laughs> parallel you know, there lives there's times, where, parallel I would, lives. There's times <laughs> where you 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 crave that person you've had a trauma bond with and he would step in and go no remember 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 Don't you know and he, he would, yeah and mm. he would let some of his frustration over the last 10 years come out However, he has just been my rock. So I've been really blessed in that area of my life. He's amazing. Um, And since cutting her out, it's really funny. It's like when you take that negative energy out of your life, you suddenly have an even bigger capacity for even for Mm -hmm. more. Um, And I've been really blessed to have amazing friends come into my life and I have my own community on Facebook which is uh for women with mother wounds or just deeply interested in spiritual and and Mm -hmm. and healing themselves and the women in that group are beautiful so I share quite vulnerable stuff with them I talk Mm -hmm. to them really openly um like for instance recently my um, mom has turned up she's she was an actress not very successful because of her ill health but she's turned up in an advert recently just what I needed (laughs) um (laughs) that's when you get to say oh what's here for me more healing yeah more learning more (laughs) More healing healing. (laughs) yeah it took a bit of processing but as I'm going through that I always share it with my community because I want them to show that it keeps going and the love and support that came through was just beautiful and they've done it for other group members as too so it's Mm. yeah as you let this negative energy out more has come in and it's been funny when I look back over my life the more and more I've got more independent from my mom the better and better quality people have come into my life I'm very blessed to have some amazing I had one friend I was I was thinking earlier when you were talking about how um some people talk about their mothers and they just have this beautiful relationship and Mm. you kind of want to tell them to piss off (laughs) um what was beautiful was one of my friends is she has amazing parents they're so so supportive so brilliant so kind um and when I did this when I cut contact with my mom we went for a coffee and she said I'm going to be really honest I don't get it but I'm I'm here for you I can't understand because I have a really but I oh she's she's a a oh that makes my heart yeah Mm. she really is she's a beautiful human being and it was just I've had more and more people like that just come into my life. Mm. And it's, uh, and that's 
why when people like feel exhausted and not ready to do this in a work I'm like please do it because yeah. what will come is so much better I am 42 now and I am the happiest I have ever been yeah I would people are like would you go back to be 19 no no way oh god no oh my god not no. for a second I wouldn't go back any period of time I am the the happiest I've ever been I have got to a point in my life where I not only like myself I love myself mm. I give myself that tenderness kindness I, you know I still have my quirks I do things that really like I'm I wonder worry I worry I wonder about myself being ADHD as well mm-hmm. um my brain is <laughs> come on over me. it's fun over here <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over the place. I'm forever leaving things everywhere because I cannot do things in order. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's where, in fact, where is it? Going? It's just... Brain's gone off. Shouldn't this be like? Um, there was no, a point no, I know where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is that. Um, where is I? I used to get really angry with myself for these yes. things. You know, the fact that I always burn porridge. I always burn pizza because I can't stay focused enough on that. I have to go off and do something else and burn everything. <laughs> totally me. Yeah, I'm terrible. To the point where my uh, my husband, was a, we've disconnected our smoke alarm outside of our kitchen because every time it went off, Dad, Shane's like, kids, dinner's ready. <laughs> my husband's like, just like do you, do you not just put the timer on? I was like, don't be silly. That just makes sense. <laughs> but also, I've got to remember that the timer is there. <laughs> I've got better at Yeah, that. yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to so, Yeah, no. So, so now I just, I I have so much love for myself that it's the same as if, you know, your children do something daft. It's just like, oh, bless. Oh, bless. Exactly. Oh, bless. Yeah. Again. You know, your child falls off the bike. You don't go, you stupid, stupid idiot, or you really idiot. shouldn't. You like, yes, well, really no. <laughs> Not outside, everyone. Not outside of your head. Whereas you pick them up and go, no, it's okay. We all fall mm. off. It's okay. Mm. Get back on. And I have and I have that kindness for myself now. Yeah. And um, and it's and I and because you have it more for yourself, you have it more for everybody else. Yes. Absolutely. This is what a lot of people don't. And that you do the work, you love yourself and your capacity to love others just grows. It grows. Yeah. And it's and it's funny. I have so much more patience, compassion. Somebody cuts me off on the road. I'm just like, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're not. Never mind. Oh, you know, let them on. Yeah, there's no need to make them wrong. Yeah. Um, that's actually been something that I've really noticed over the last probably a couple of years when I've been doing um Probably more so like I was saying before we started recording, like did a lot of mindset and coaching training, very head-based. And then in the last five years have really, really sunk into my body and releasing old stuckness and trauma from my body and using breath and really understanding how important rest is. And Mm. when you've been conditioned to always be hypervigilant to someone else's needs, rest doesn't come naturally, right? So it's like like it's a muscle that you really have to Mm. sink into. But as a result of all that, just softening, softening my inner voice, softening the way that I see other people, softening, yeah, just Mm. always, not always, that would be ridiculous to say, but having more of a bias towards oh that's okay like you know yeah rather than you know, my old inner voice which was you need to do yeah. it better you need to try harder you need to you you fucked that up because you didn't you know yeah. xyz like fill in the blank sort of thing like self-flagellation <laughs> yeah one of the things that has brought me the most peace I would say is one that I don't take life so seriously mm-hmm. or myself very seriously anymore but it's, I don't hold on to any really firm beliefs apart from very few mm. things like, you know, mm-hmm. I'm very passionate about LGBTQ and, and diversity yes. and things like that. Yeah. However, I no longer, I used to hold really strong political views and other people were wrong and I was right. Yes, and yes, I've yes, completely yes. let go of the need to be right. And I, mm. I really, I think if you have really firm beliefs, it filters your ability to, um, get clear information in because your brain will naturally go to the information that backs up that belief. Correct. 
Yeah. But that also comes into the way that you view yourself. If you believe things mm. about yourself, all you will get is more evidence for that. Mm-hmm. I'm stupid. I'm useless. My yep, worth only comes from helping. Whereas if you let go of any belief about yourself and kind of just keep a truly open mind about yourself, about everything, mm. even like when everybody was so angry about Donald Trump. I was like, well, maybe he's here for a reason. Maybe he needs to agitate things. I don't know. Mm. And I, and that you could, or what, you know, COVID should wear masks, don't wear masks, should get injected. Oh, shouldn't get. so many. Opinions. And I was just like, I don't know. And I actually don't think any, all we're seeing is people's opinions on the news. Mm. We don't know. Nobody really knows. All I want anyone to do is to trust their own intuition if your intuition is telling you to wear a mask wear a mask if Mm -hmm. your intuition is telling you not to then don't yeah and I know there will be people who will argue with me about how that affects other people but yeah 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 at the end at the end of the day I uh I'm a true believer in your own intuition because I really believe we're divine beings Mm -hmm. here to experience a human experience and what each one of us has come to experience something different. Mm-hmm. Our, I see it as a game, like a computer game. Yeah. And what our goal is at the end or what we're meant to experience and go through is different for different people. Yeah. So I've chosen to be mainly plant-based. I, mm-hmm. I'm not completely vegan, but I'm mainly plant-based with my diet. And I feel yeah. that's the right thing for me. However, if somebody else's journey involves them eating meat and it's mm-hmm. part of it, then that's not for me to say, that's wrong. Their soul is is here to learn something and however they need to learn it is right for them, whatever that is. And when I just let go of that, oh my God. (laughs) It's so much nicer to live from that place, isn't it? It's just a a nicer way to live. Yeah, exactly. I I once had a conversation with somebody who was really angry about COVID stuff and I was just went, I just looked at him and said, that doesn't look like it feels very nice. (laughs) And you could just see him go. Oh. I am discombobulated by the comments. <laughs> I cannot compute. And you could just see he was just like, I mean, lovely guy, but you put so much anger in him. And I was just like, mm. that doesn't look like that. Feels very nice. Yeah. Why are you doing that to yourself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, sorry. I, what we? No, no, that's all right. Um, this is reminding me of when I oh, originally, years and years ago, did traditional Chinese medicine training, and we were learning like five elements and. Um, there's this belief in five element theory that the first um, first element or first organ system, which is really an energy, is stomach and spleen, and that's all about um, how we see ourselves. And it's very deeply connected to how we're mothered um, and how we learn to be in the world and all of those things. But one of the things that um, the belief system of TCM is, is if that is not formed well and if you're not connected or attached to someone who does love you unconditionally one of the things that can happen as an imbalance is to to very rigidly hold on to beliefs Mm. about what is right and what is wrong and Mm -hmm. I have a feeling or at least from my own experience that because my childhood was quite chaotic that my wanting to have a black and white view of the world is just seeking safety and control it's like you know Mm. I'm not I'm not safe, you know, as, as a little kid, therefore I need to control. And that, that made me a very good carer, like very good, like mm. pats on the head. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, that it, it kind of makes sense to me that the more that you heal the pieces of you that need to have that surety and the more that you open up to being connected to universal love and being, you know, I also hold the same belief. I I feel like before we come into choosing to be in a human body, we choose what the experience is. And we also invite all of the relationships and wounds and challenges yeah. and joy and all of those things to allow us to experience that. Um, which is why when I, you know, some people very much identify as um, you know, being a victim of trauma or, or, you know, that sort of thing. And I'm like, yeah, so what's the, what's the beauty in that? Like the, mm. the Donald Trump thing, again, I'm very much the same. Yeah. It's like, he obviously needs to be here to create something or make us look at okay. something or, you know, call yeah. to arms in a different way or what, not arms as in guns, I, yeah. you know, I know you <laughs> coming mean, together yeah. as, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, can we go down the path of when you, when you, you said when you were introducing yourself about 
connecting people to their spirit guides and this um, complete, because one of the things that I always say to clients is, you know, your heart, your internal gut, like internal compass, whatever you want, intuition, whatever name you want to give it, is never ever going to lead you astray. And it's also never ever going to tell you a story of like, you're not right. You're not, you know, it, there's no negativity attached to this. No. That's my deep feeling. And so you when you're talking about spirit guides and you said, mm-hmm. you know, you said like that deep unconditional love and that connection and joy, like your own sort of cheer squad. Um, mm. How, so obviously when you did your spiritual development circles early on and you were developing like building the capacity to sort of connect Mm -hmm. what difference has that made in your journey to be able to to connect to those um the cheer squad (laughs) yeah yourself but then also what difference does that make to your clients like what what does that set them free to do I mean the the first difference it made to me, because when I first started going to that um, group, I was depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, I had anxiety. Yeah. It didn't shift the anxiety, but it shifted the depression. depression yeah. and, and I really believe that's because for me, depression comes from a deep feeling of isolation. It's thinking about the past a lot, yeah. but it's also a deep feeling of isolation. And once you've really connected with your spirit guides and you really know that they're just there with you all the time. Mm-hmm. You don't feel alone in the same way. You can feel lonely, mm. but not that deep isolation. So at any time I can just kind of plug myself in, which I just do by getting still. Yeah. The first thing I teach any client is stillness. Yes. And um, just by pausing, I can just feel them there. Revolutionary rest. My God, this is something that's coming up so much yeah. for me. The pause, pause, the power is in the pause. pause, the power is in the present moment, resting, yeah. connecting. Stillness is, is key. You can't yeah. hear them if you don't get still. No. You can't. And you don't have space in your life when you're fulfilling the busyness and the ticking of the boxes and they're trying to make yourself feel better by whatever, whatever mm. that whatever that thing is for you. Yeah. Um, so mm. when I because when I work with people one to one, I take mm-hmm. them through what I call my serene way. And mm-hmm. the reason I it was actually Kat who helped me come up with this mm-hmm. initially. I love the language. It's kind of, it's grown beautiful. since then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kat's amazing. Um, the serene way is kind of a way of the way I broke down the benefits of working with me at first. So mm-hmm. that's what me and Kat worked on was that serene meant that I could help you get still, connect, you know, start working with your emotions rather than against them, reconnect yes. with yourself and your spirit guides, mm-hmm. understand that you are energy and how you can protect it, mm-hmm. help you to get in the power of now and to self-empowerment. But what spirit brought to me as a download at like 12 o'clock at night when you know when you can't sleep you're like yes yeah what are you telling me (laughs) and they made it really clear yeah this isn't the benefits of the way you work this is a structure to how you work with people so this serene way has now become Mm. how I follow and how I work with my clients has taken them through this but stillness is is absolutely key so when I I also teach a serene spiritual development course so I Mm -hmm. teach people the way I connect with spirit guides Mm -hmm. and that spirit brought me as well another model I do love them they do send me (laughs) some really (laughs) useful stuff is what I call the sat model so that's stillness allowing and trust Mm -hmm. so stillness is really learning Mm. to pause in so many different ways there is no single way to do it Mm -mm. allowing is giving them permission telling them they can, that it's okay. Letting go of some of that fear. People get scared of connecting with their spirit guides. Yes. They think it's going to be like ghosts and it really isn't. Um, (laughs) And then trust. So -hmm. when you do start getting messages, when you do start seeing white feathers, when music suddenly turns to a a song that means something to you out of, you know, synchronicity. Synchronicities, yes. You you trust them and you give give thanks. Yeah. So I, I coach people through that. But, um, The difference I've seen this have on the women I work with is one, I just see them fully embracing who they are. Mm. It's like having that backup team who's always got them just really enables them. It makes them feel secure so they can just be themselves. Mm. It makes them feel loved. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that security from having that love. 
I had one client who the, one of the main turning points for her was when her grandmother came through and she was just in my chair, just tears pouring down her face. Just, I can feel her hands. She's holding my hand. She's holding my hand. And from that moment, she just said, I just know she's got me. Yeah. Yeah. And that changed so much. Other clients I've seen how when they start getting this relationship with their guides, which then helps them get a better relationship with themselves, it then spreads to all their other relationships. Yes. Yep. Yep. So they start one of them, one of my clients says, I just, I just don't, I just don't let anybody take the piss anymore. You know, yes. that's it. Like, but she also was showing them how to treat her. This mm-hmm. is how I'm going to be treated from now on. Mm-hmm. But also had more compassion for them and understanding them better too. So it is a two way street. So it really seems to impact on the relationships. I one client I had, when um, when I first met her, she just sent, I posted something about, I can help you to truly shine so much that everybody else will need shades. You know, it's a bit of a joke. But, yeah, yeah. And she just went, yeah, yeah, let's see what you can do with me. And at that point, she was quite demotivated, really struggling. She was in a marriage that wasn't serving her or him, mm-hmm. to be fair. Mm-hmm. Um, And, she, you know, she was, she was not happy by the end of working with her she had um she went through my fearlessly serene program my one-to-one program and then did my uh, development course by the end of that she had ended her marriage she'd moved out she changed her career she was like (laughs) you know and then really And it was just amazing to see how empowered she felt, how much more confident she was. And to to her, she said, the key moment was really connecting with my guides and trusting that connection and knowing that it's there and that faith in that had just kind of set her on her way. And it's um, it's so beautiful to watch these women who, when I meet them, I can see their beauty. Mm. You can see how amazing they are. They can't, but I can. Mm-hmm. And it, watching them start to see it in themselves is beautiful yeah absolutely like I have one client who came to me and she sat in my chair she wouldn't do any spiritual work that's not what she's interested in but she sat in my chair and within minutes I was like you're autistic and you don't know it Mm. and so much of her trauma had come from just being misunderstood all her life or Mm -hmm. not her life being built around a different way of being you know that didn't suit her Mm -hmm. and it had caused trauma as a child and just watching her just starting to accept and and know that it's okay that she needs quiet space that if she goes into a cafe she needs to be sat in the corner with her back yeah. against the wall with no yeah. one behind her mm-hmm. that that's okay there's nothing wrong with that mm-hmm. you know and acceptance has been the big one for her and she was like I've gone from being so disappointed in myself mm. how heartbreaking is that to now accepting who I am she's not quite gotten to the loving stage yet we're we're getting there yeah yeah but she's accepting who she is and it's um guys beautiful and so um I around the autism end of things like I I feel like that is such a huge thing it's been such a huge thing for me to Mm. like I have always had this sort of filter of myself of like um things that are very natural for me and now I can sort of see okay that's partly ADHD I've also got um, a form of female autism and um, mm-hmm. so I see things now and I go oh but it's not it's not the label that gives you the freedom it's actually just no. the oh that's that's who I am by design mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. all these things that I've historically made myself wrong for for like mm-hmm. trying something and quitting too early. That was the, the reference point I had for myself. No, no, mm. my brain just needs novelty. I need to be mm. engaged and excited about new stuff. Yeah. And also I have a very, very strong filter of what I do and don't accept in environments. And so when I find myself, like when I was in corporate, find myself in environments similar to the coffee shop where I'm like, this is physically uncomfortable for me. Mm. I cannot do this. My last role mm-hmm. was working big team, open plan environment. Oof. That was like hell on earth for my yeah. life. And it took so much of my mental and emotional energy mm-hmm. to be able to lead a team in that environment. I would get home and I literally could not talk to my family, could not. And mm-hmm. I'm like, this is the gold of actually 
the acceptance piece. It's like, that's just who I am. And that is beautiful. It's a constant journey, isn't it? Is yeah, of, of discovering about yourself. Like I mm. don't have a diagnosis in any way, and I, part of me would be really curious to go mm. and pay and find out. But mm-hmm. part of me already realizes I'm already there, though. It actually I doesn't accept, matter. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm already. <laughs> I know my brain is neurodivergent in some way or other. Yeah, the fine yeah. detail and label that's given that doesn't matter. But I'm getting better and better at, at, at really just accepting me for me so I realized recently that uh, transition is a big thing for me so Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. coming back I recently went on holiday and came Mm -hmm. back and really struggled the first two weeks to get back into my business Mm -hmm. and get back Mm -hmm. into my work yeah and it was like a lightning bolt like oh it's a transition so I got really kind with myself I didn't put too much pressure on myself to get too much done I gave myself the mundane easy tasks mm-hmm. yep. but actually I've been waiting on my to-do list yes. for, for forever because they're boring yeah <laughs> but I got them done because they were easy to just kind of mm-hmm. pedal through and that got me to a space where then I could move on and I I started working on um I realized mornings are a big transition for me so I can wake up really quite panicky Mm -hmm. and I've had it for a few years now where I wake up it's probably linked to perimenopause anxious (laughs) yeah (laughs) so I've started now I sit up in bed Mm -hmm. I meditate in bed with my warm duvet so I'm not huge transition to get out of bed yes it's up in bed with my back straight so I'm Mm -hmm. giving myself Mm -hmm. that straight Mm -hmm. spinal cord to let the Mm -hmm. energy up and I meditate and just open my chakras Mm -hmm. do my gratitudes then with a fluffy dressing gown on because this is England and it's cold in the morning yes yes yeah I I go into my bathroom and I do some really gentle Pilates and yoga exercises and that just eases me into the day. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I just, it's those little things. Like I've had other people say, you know, routines, you should be doing this every day and this every day. And I got way overwhelmed. It just wasn't, it was too much. Like you're supposed to journal and meditate and do this and do that. And I'm like, whoa. It's not the right way for everybody though. That structure works for some people really well. I yeah, it was for me whoa no no and it was really giving myself permission to discover this on my own and that came through stillness yes. peace yep. and my guides just giving me little niggles now mm-hmm. and again just mm-hmm. try this mm-hmm. just try mm-hmm. and, and just really trusting in that and letting it evolve naturally and surrendering to who I am surrendering yeah. to surrender's the a big gentleness one. yeah gentleness mm-hmm. such a that's a I mean before like the softening it's like yeah I don't um I've started this because I've only been out of my corporate role not even two months and I was just talking in a group this morning and I was like oh my god I'm actually living you know when you do that my perfect day thing like you know every so often that will pop up and I'm like I am living in my perfect day and one of my biggest biggest things that my soul has always craved and I've never ever um given myself permission to create which comes a lot from um I don't know as you're talking something the thread for me is as a result of paying attention to clearing relationships that don't work Mm -hmm. what naturally comes as a result of that is I'm now available to receive a different Mm -hmm. way of being a yeah. gentleness, a softness, a, a receiving support on all levels. That's why beautiful friends turn up. That's why gorgeous mm. Facebook communities, because that's where your energy, you know, that's the mm. invitation there, right? I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's your turn. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, so a big thing for me is time freedom. So the fact mm. that I don't have to, you know, sit in a car commuting for nine hours a week, be in mm. an environment that absolutely bleeds me dry, blah, 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 blah. But mm. that beautiful flow of what do I actually feel to do this morning? Do I want to go for a walk? Do I want to go and lift heavy weights? Do I want to just get on my yoga mat? Do I want to go back to bed? And just mm. actually allowing yourself to do that is such a beautiful place to be. Whereas, really is. you know, unfortunately we do live um, or at least in Australia, it's still in a society where achievement is still like, you know, the golden. And I'm like, this is why depression and anxiety are so strong because mm. there's so many people so out of alignment. And I agree that depression is definitely isolation, but also like, what, what am I doing that is deeply exhausting me? What do I mm. actually need to be able to not do anymore? I think we've, we've become so 
disconnected like we are mm. constantly um on screens and oh. we don't we don't just have time with our own mm-hmm. selves yeah. and we get so disconnected from it. even something as simple as we look down all the time because we're mm-hmm. looking at phones and actually I don't it's know a lot and you'll probably tell me more way more about this in the vagus nerve and everything but how bad that is for you to be it looking is down. bad yeah really bad and spiritually I get this through, I do free um, spirit guide readings to my group every Friday. And one message that comes through time and time again, look, look Look up. Yeah. And it's that if you do it, when you're going on a walk, you'll notice, you know, Mm -hmm. you, you're looking where you're putting your feet and you're Mm -hmm. just lost in your own thoughts. If you look up, you come out of your thoughts and you just go, wow, look how beautiful that sky is. Look how beautiful. And you come out of your mind and you step into your divine self. The sense of wonder. And it brings wonder, curiosity, gratitude. Mm, yeah. It's just look up. If there's one bit of advice I could give anyone, look up. <laughs> I want to add, it's... look the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Constantly saying to my daughters, I'm like, hello, look hello. Up. Yeah. <laughs> hello, here I am in front of you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you just do it. if you do it if you go for a walk and you just look up it's just yeah. like phenomenal the shift yeah. Rhonda Byrne talks it in in about it in her latest book where she gets you to really look at the back of your hand and really focus on the back of your hand mm-hmm. what you tend to find when you do it is you start going oh look at that wrinkle or look at this or you know my hands could do with a bit of moisture yeah <laughs> And you get really you notice your mind starts ticking now she says now pull up and look just look up and notice your whole body relaxes, notice you, your mind shifts. And it's it's just so true. Look up. Yeah, look up. Yeah. Look up. Yeah, and start looking outside of yourself for all the answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We could chat for another three hours. I was just going to say we could talk. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's like, oh, yes, we're ticking along here. Um, okay, so you mentioned um, anxiety. I want to pull this back to perimenopause um, because we were talking mm. before we started recording about this, um, you know, I say in the intro to the podcast, like we run out of fucks to give. Um, mm-hmm. What's been your experience? And so I'm assuming you're at the start of maybe yeah. the sort of awareness. I of actually, I, th- I think um, I may be only 42, but I have a feeling I've been in perimenopause a while yeah. and I just didn't realise that's, what, you know, I have aches and pains in my feet. Mm-hmm. I've been waking up with palpitations in my chest. All very, um, yep. You know, periods going Hey, just getting odd mm-hmm. they're just mm-hmm. odd mm-hmm. um yep. and rage yeah <laughs> perimenopause rage okay you know s- suddenly my uh pmt just got worse yeah yeah, yep, yep, yep. just like i just i have to say to my child i'm really sorry <laughs> mm. <laughs> i'm so sorry it's not you i know there's just i'm i'm, I'm struggling here um and it's uh yeah, so I think I've been actually going through it for a while now and just not realised. Yeah, um, the training that I'm doing, um, which is specific to supporting people through stages of menopause, one mm-hmm. of the things that I've learned in the last weekend is this: there's a late reproductive stage before you hit perimenopause. So I didn't even realise that that was a stage. Um, and I will do an episode on all of these different indicators but Mm. this um notion that perimenopause is something that happens sort of in your mid to mid 40s to mid 50s is a very flawed um Mm. the changes start happening the late reproductive stage can start happening as early as 30s early 30s um Mm. and one of the really common things is anxiety palpitation difficulty sleeping and it all makes sense when you think about all of the different because estrogen has so many different impacts Mm. on that I didn't realize like I'm a biologist originally originally but I did my biology degree like in the early 90s oh my god that makes me sound (laughs) I should have very white hair and a cloak of wisdom on (laughs) um but yeah so I'd forgotten all of this magic because I the reason I did um biology and then genetics and all sorts of things was the fascination of the magic of just being human like our our bodies are just miraculous 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 Mm. um but yeah estrogen is in so many different systems and we were talking on the weekend about this rage thing because we each of us in this group shared our experience so far of if we're there already or whatever of perimenopause and beyond and um i said my first indication i turned 47 in january and it was like a flip of a switch and it was like 
out of control, like either crying or rage. <laughs> like that was mm. my two in the second half yeah. of my cycle. Anyway, turns out very common. And for me personally, and often for other people, it's a drop in progesterone in the second half of your cycle. Yes. Um, but I also, I have a feeling for myself, at least that part of my, part of the rage and the strength of those feelings coming through was Mm. actually calling me to process anger that was held from childhood. So it's like, it just felt like, yes, it was because of a hormone change and a cascade in, you know, physicality, but it was like for me anyway, perimenopause was like, hey, there's stuff to be looked at over here. Like there's Mm. unprocessed, unhealed, not helpful, limiting shit (laughs) that you need to deal with. Um, And that's been such a beautiful invitation. And I just think that to me, never, ever taking away from the fact that perimenopause can be an absolute cluster fuckery for some people, (laughs) like you know, honoring everyone's experience. But Mm. I do think that it is this natural call to, I want to say call to arms again. That's very weird because that's not my usual language, but call to arms of like, what's here for me? You know, I think it's call to arms for yourself, right? Mm. Yeah, It's like your body finally goes, right. You know, you're not being called to reproduce anymore. Mm -mm. You're being called now to look after you. Yes, exactly. I think it's, I don't, you know, I don't think it's any surprise that I cut my mum out in my late thirties. I don't think that's any surprise. I think the timing came for numerous reasons of support I had in my life and Mm -hmm, understandings mm -hmm. I had, but I think, yeah, a lot of it was Mm. because of that, that I think there is a power that comes with menopause and perimenopause and that, you know, no more fucks to give. Absolutely. Yeah. No more fucks to give. Yeah. Well, you just like, no, I've given enough now. I- yeah. And the biology behind that, like I'm very, very excited to be interviewing some, like a neurobiologist mm-hmm. about exactly this, where oh, we yeah. literally in our 20s and 30s, our role biologically and evolutionarily, if that's a word, um, is to <laughs> find is a now. mate. Yeah, exactly. Hey, whatever. Um, find a mate, procreate and protect our family. That's our, mm. that's our evolutionary drive. Mm-hmm. and the drive as soon as our eggs start drying up is like oh okay we don't have to worry about that anymore and now yeah the connections that mm-hmm. require that I'm not speaking very scientifically accurately but anyway we literally mm-hmm. come to a different stage in our lives um can you speak last question I promise I know it's very late it's for fine. you I'm don't so worry. sorry it's like the middle of the <laughs> night in England oh, sure <laughs> um can you talk about the crone end of things in spirituality? You said that you wanted to cover that um, in terms of yeah. this transition that happens. There's just, from a spiritual understanding, there's just, as you become older as a woman, you're stepping into a wise woman phase, mm-hmm. the crone phase. You know, we when you look back um you know, if you look at Native American, you look at other um, original communities, cultures mm-hmm. where women had a more powerful position. Yes. You always get the wise woman, the medicine mm-hmm. woman, the wise mm-hmm. woman, and they're never young, right? <laughs> and that's because of that, because they've stepped in, they've gathered all that information. I think, I think there's a lot to be said for, through menopause, embracing that embracing the becoming an older woman embracing Mm -hmm. just being you Mm -hmm. you know um one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about all this and moving to a stage that I think it's also really important to acknowledge those women who decided not to have children or couldn't absolutely that they too are stepping out of the constant pressure from other people to say, well, you're going to have children. And why oh, are you going to have children? No. And the freedom from that now, like, yes, you know, Absolutely. piss off, I can't have them anymore. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> That's a done and, deal. Stop asking questions and being rude. <laughs> yeah. And that complete, you know, it's not that they'll, I just think it's really important to validate that choice. I just wanted to, it just came up for me as we talked about it. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Yeah. I think it's so important that that's a choice and that's a perfectly good choice for whoever. Um, Because I've got friends who just did not want children. And I just think, brilliant, go and be you. Yeah. And I think 
for all women, I think it is this real phase of really getting in touch with who am I and who do I want to be and really sharing your wisdom we've been through a lot by the time we've got to this age Mm -hmm. you know we start having to care for parents we've had children or friends that we've cared for we've been through careers and career choices and changes and ups and downs and moving house (laughs) you know we've got so much we've been through there's so much wisdom there and I think it's really I think it's so important when it comes to menopause to yes acknowledge the fuckery that comes with it but also wow the power that comes with it the freedom like we were talking before we yeah. before we started recording about talking about how you you get to this age and you become a little bit more invisible and actually while some people don't like it wow that's so it. free <laughs> like I don't have to be pretty for anybody exactly. anymore I don't have to be cool I can just be me god damn it Absolutely. and it's and you know there's something lovely about being able to go for a drink in a pub and just get left alone. Yeah. It's great. You know, men just leave me alone now. And just <laughs> it's just bloody wonderful. And um, but yeah, that freedom in just embracing being an older woman and the wisdom that comes. And and yes, the fact that I have no desire to be younger. I love being the age I am. Oh, I love yes. the fact that I don't want to go clubbing and be in noisy clubs and have to queue at bars around sweaty, smelly people. I don't want to do that anymore. Oh, yuck, I have yuck. no desire. I want to go to retreats and do cacao ceremonies. Yes. And <laughs> sit under the stars and have you good know, conversations. Around <laughs> like this. Exactly. I want to be, you know, in conversations with other wise women and deep meaningful yes. conversations and absolutely. beautiful yeah I just think so good embrace it yeah just absolutely. embrace the getting older embrace mm. the lines in your face and you know like I have my stomach's a right mess you know my my son was 10 pound two holy dooly and I'm only five foot three so he <laughs> did a lot of that's a lot of baby <laughs> yeah but I wouldn't, I'm very proud of that. I carried a baby of that size and uh, and gave birth naturally in water. Thank goodness. <laughs> very slowly. <laughs> yeah. but those stretch marks, those marks, the wobbly belly I've got, would I swap it? Not for a second. No, me neither. You know, and, you know, the laugh lines on my face, the scars that I've got around on my body. I just, it's all part of me. It's part of my yeah. journey. And it's so just, beautiful. that's for me what, there's different spiritual interpretations from different angles. We'll talk about wise woman. But for me, it's just about stepping into to just being you. Yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly, mm. and it all being beautifully you. That's yeah. why I don't really like to say ugly, but you know. It's all part of you. Yeah, I think it's absolutely. All so much power in that and magic. That's why I always say, you know, midlife crisis, fuck that. It's like midlife no. magic. Who do you want to yeah, be? Yeah, I love midlife magic. That's lovely. Yeah, midlife magic to me because I'm just like when you step back into the deep power that comes from just being yourself. And I, I keep on, the, the word that keeps coming to my mind is unapologetic and it's it's not mm. quite the right word, but it's just like, this is who I am. I don't need to receive your love and approval. I don't need to overstep my boundaries to prove myself to you. I just am. It's like, I think sometimes when you say unapologetically you, I think some people can take that as aggressively being me. And it's not that. Mm -mm. It's just the, I think like I love the word serene. Obviously Mm. that's why it's in all my, in my work, but it's that being serenely unapologetically you. It's just, I'm me. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. fine. And I'm not attached. You know, what, yeah. What whatever opinion you have of me is none of my business. And I'm yeah. gonna live over here in peace. Exactly. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Such a good way to finish. All right. Uh final thing to tell everyone that's listening. We'll put this in the show notes, but how do people find you online? And you mentioned your Facebook group before. So do you want to shout that out as well? And I'll make sure. So Yes. You find me very easily online because basically if you put Geraldine Crane into Google, I will pop up. Um, my website is uh, www.geraldinecrane.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've my Facebook is just Geraldine Crane. Beautiful. My And the same on TikTok and Instagram. I think I'm Geraldine Crane Serene. Um, and my Facebook group is Serene Spiritual and Empowered. 
Serene, spiritual, and empowered. Beautiful. I will yeah. connect all of those things in the show notes. Um, shout that. out to Kat Marshall for connecting oh, us. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I'm also working on the moment. It's um, going to be a website that's a hub of all my group services. And I oh, am cool. working on a new paid membership, which is going to be Ooh. called the Serene Spiritual Inner Circle. Oh, lovely. So where people can access group coaching, group readings and group meditations. So nice. it's just, you know, you pay monthly. It's just so a lot of people wanting to come to work with me, but can't afford the one-to-one yes, work right yeah, now yeah, yeah. for obvious yeah. reasons. So it's just making it more accessible for other yeah, people. Beautiful. So yeah, that's coming. Awesome. But yes, a good shout out to Kat. Yeah. Yes, I love that woman. <laughs> My goodness. Oh, she's such a beautiful human. Thank yes, you she so is. much. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. I've enjoyed that so much. And yes, for anyone who's listening, who is having that level of awareness around a mother wound or any relationship that feels like it's costing you too much. Um, yeah. Really encourage you to um, feel into what the healing of that would set free for you because yeah, there is no freedom in being stuck in those bonds. So mm-hmm. thank you for sharing your gold. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for staying up. It's been been a joy though. It's been an absolute joy. (laughs) See you later. Bye bye. Hello, beautiful. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm just here to celebrate the fact that we have just clicked over 1,000 downloads of this beautiful podcast, Baby of Mine. So funny to think because it's 55 days or 56 days today since I actually had the idea and thought, yeah, yeah, I'm going to create that and I'm going to share stories and hopefully women will really resonate with all the messages. And you have resonated, you've taken the time to pop in reviews and messages and DMs to me just to say how inspirational all of these guest stories have been. And I'm so, so grateful that you're tuning in. And I'm just wondering if, like me, as we draw to the close of 2022, you're starting to realize that you are quite freaking tired. (laughs) There's been a lot going on, right, on a global scale in our communities, um, breaking down of big structures in our society and, and conditioned belief systems or shared belief systems. And for a lot of people that I know, me included, a lot of stuff going on in personal lives, a lot of taxing, stretching stuff. And the thing is that I hear all the time that we've been taught that we need to keep pushing through. You know, we need to push through to get anywhere. We need to push through the tiredness or the exhaustion. But I'm here to actually offer a different point of view. What if the reverse is actually true? What if the very thing we actually need most to settle our nervous systems, to help our bodies feel safe and our minds to be calm, is actually to rest more? Rather revolutionary, isn't it? I've decided as a gift from me to you for the end of 2022 and as we cross over the threshold into a brand new year to gift you a beautiful experience called Revolutionary Rest. Revolutionary Rest is a deeply relaxing and restorative yoga nidra experience that combines body and breath to come into stillness and just to be. And it provides a beautiful respite from all the stress and the busyness and the obligation you might be feeling through the silly season. And I just really, really want you to be able to be gentle with yourselves. Be gentle. Remember that you are a precious, precious, miraculous being and you need to be taken care of as well. So you'll find Revolutionary Rest completely free um, on the podcast website at kyliepatchett.com.au. I really, really hope you enjoy it. I've just listened back to it myself and as much as it is a little bit weird to do a meditation to your own voice, it is really beautifully relaxing and it actually is including a few of the tips that I learned in my last week's training and next weekend coming Um, I've just been joining uh, a beautiful lady in Ireland called Neve Daly and she has a form of yoga called Instinct Yoga and the, the qualification that I'm doing is all about yoga to support the stages of menopause including perimenopause and menopause and beyond and one of the big things that we've talked about is that a key for supporting ourselves in our physical, emotional, mental spiritual health everything 
is to come to stillness and rest so much more than what we do. So I hope you'll take me up on my offer as a gift from me to you. Merry Christmas if you celebrate and Happy New Year if you're listening to this in January. Have a beautiful, beautiful day. Thanks, guys. Bye.